There are very few clear recordings of my dad. I had the old LPs. I bought one, listened to it. Extremely disappointing sound quality. I'd, I'd heard many of the Stinson recordings on the LPs that had come out over the years, and they just didn't sound good at all. They were bad. I was a friend of Lucia Sutera. Uh, Lucia lived on 8th Avenue in the same apartment building as my brother. So, and actually they became best friends. They were incredibly, incredibly close. Irene Harris lived in the same building on 8th Avenue in Brooklyn that my brother and Lucia lived in. And Lucia was the kind of person who would adopt people. At some point in their relationship, Irene told her about her husband's record business and the remnants of it that was in the basement. And she said, it's yours if you want it, and there's unreleased Woody Guthrie in it. I fell in love with the sweetest gal in all this big wide nation. Mo Ash and Herbert Harris were in business together as Stinson Records. And at the beginning of the war was when they made all of the Woody Guthrie recordings. So he came in from the Merchant Marine and, and recorded with Cisco Houston. And it just it was a very, very exciting, prolific time for him. And those, and those masters and mothers and all of the business part of that stayed with Herbert Harris when after the war, Mo Ash and, and Herbert Harris broke up. Lucia came into possession of it by way of just befriending Irene, and Lucia kept it and didn't do much with it until she finally got to the point of saying, yes, I'm retired, yes, I want to do something with it. Uh, and that's when she called me, and I called Michael. We went into awesome. Brooklyn and went into the basement and spent, yeah. you know, about four or five hours down there just looking through all the material. And I mean, there's just big barrels, you know, about four feet high. We decided to get some people together, and we went to Doug Pemroy's studio, and he played some of those masters. And they listened to Woody Guthrie and heard him in a way they had never heard him before. And just looking at their faces as they heard it for the first time was just so awesome. This one's definitely better in terms of sound quality. It's just really, really well done. It's, it's almost as though we had a second chance to go in and record him again. I mean, it almost feels that way. Nora herself was pretty amazed when she first heard the tracks and that was pretty gratifying. For me to hear clear, clean, healthy voice, is always extraordinary to me because I don't have a memory of it and there are very few recordings where I hear that healthy, vibrant man in the prime of his life. So it always kind of penetrates me and I, it kind of stops me in my tracks and I always have a moment where I go, hi dad, <laughs> you know, wow, hi. I've been a hitting some hard traveling, I thought you know. I've been a hitting some hard traveling. I originally learned about the Woody Guthrie Masters from Michael Creamer, and he played me uh, the Woody Guthrie recordings of This Land is Your Land and Bad Reputation from the Stinson Masters, which he had learned about from his cousin Jim Farrow. The sound quality was just astonishing. This land is your land, and this land is my land, from California. One thing led to another, and ultimately we were, we were able to make a deal to have access to this wonderful treasure trove of, of original Woody Guthrie masters. Uh, it's it's going to be revelatory for anybody to hear these and hear what Woody sounded like in, in the mid-40s as they've never heard before. Most of the parts that were used for these Woody Guthrie recordings were the, the mothers, the actual records from which the stampers were made and then the, the 78s were pressed from those. So it's, it's about as uh, close to the original sources as you could find these days. A lot of people have this image of him as a kind of the solo guitar player, the guy out on the street by himself, a loner. And he wasn't actually, he was very, very congenial and, and particularly loved playing with other musicians. And I was surprised in these recordings that they're very distinct. You know, you can really hear the different musicians playing their part. My dad never played this song the same way twice, so a lot of times there would be three, four, five beats between verses, depending on the mood he was in. So everyone had to just kind of be there with him. You had to be really paying attention. And that's what you hear in the recordings. And that, for me, I kind of suddenly went, 
wow, they're good. Essentially, Nora gave us free run of the archives in terms of what we wanted to use in the packaging materials for the Woody Guffrey box set, which is called My Dusty Road. The title came from a notebook that Woody kept, and he had painted in callig calligraphy on the cover, Woody Guthrie, My Dusty Road, and it seemed like a, a beautiful title. So there are quite a few unpublished photos and pieces of Woody's artwork in the booklet. Nora, Nora Guthrie totally got into this and, and found even more materials for us to draw from, um, many of which nobody's ever seen before. Woody's idea of, it, of songwriting was, all you can write is what you see. That's what he writes in his notebooks. And what that meant to him is whatever he was looking at that day was worthy of a song. So when he was in the Merchant Marines, he became very, very involved in writing about life on the ship and the sailors, and uh, particularly in writing fighting songs for the guys who he was bringing over in these huge Liberty ship convoys. So these were songs that were written sometimes on the spot that day for these guys. Uh, a lot of them have this, you know, theme song, we're going to go get those fascists and mow them down and this and that. That's a union that'll tear the fascists down, down, down. That's a union that'll tear the fascists down. He would go out with a coat and come home without the coat. And my mother was freaking out because we were very, very poor. I'm like, where's your coat? And he'd go, I... There was a guy who looked really cold <laughs> down the street. He looked colder than me. <laughs> you know, that's an extraordinary teaching. And he sings about it in Pretty Boy Floyd. Who's the, who's the bad guy? Who's the robber? When he writes at the end of Pretty Boy Floyd, some rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. And here we are witnessing that song play out in our society. Some will rob you with a six gun, some with a fountain pen. He had an optimism about America that ran through all of his stuff. He sang some protest songs. He was angry about a few things here and there, but he also had a sense of playfulness with his children's songs and, and just uh, and poetry that I think spans generations and uh, captures people from many different uh, walks of life. He had kind of a simplicity but an elegance, if you, if you want to say that, uh, to uh, the way he phrased things. I ain't going to be treated this way. I ain't going to be treated this way. There's that kind of teaching in every single song that is so applicable not just to today, but always will be, because he's dealing with human nature. He keeps us on the path, on his dusty road, and says, try to stay somewhere in here, you know. That's why we need to hear all of this material again. Jesus Christ was a man that traveled through the land, hard-working man and brave. He said to the rich, give your goods to the poor. So they laid Jesus Christ in his grave. Jesus was a man, a carpenter by hand, his followers true and brave. One dirty coward called Judas Iscariot has laid Jesus Christ in his grave.